more bombers, a new landing gear, and this B-52 crew is about to show it in action. Watching these men draw their personal equipment, you may be reminded of Captain Video's Space Playmates. If so, it's those T-1 flying suits tested to withstand pressure at an altitude of 106,000 feet and helmets that can take blasts of wind with velocities up to 725 miles per hour. With each man at his assigned station, this B-52 takes off on a dry run. And now for that new wrinkle. By merely turning the knob on his crosswind instrument, the pilot sets into operation an automatic gear shifting device that turns the wheels on an entirely new type undercarriage, one that makes for easy maneuvering, no matter the velocity or direction of winds at variance with the runway. The newly developed undercarriage consists of four sets of double wheel gears placed side by side, two before and two behind, to support the 300,000 pound plane. The gears are not stationary, but rotate around their axis. The rear pair operate independently of the forward pair, making it possible to maneuver the plane almost within its own length. The action is not unlike that of the standard fire truck. Advised of wind direction from the airfield's control tower, the pilot merely sets the instrument knob and the rest is automatic. It all adds up to new safety and efficiency for rough weather takeoff and landing. In Washington, the Navy unveils the Grasshopper, developed for use in Operation Deep Freeze. Designed for airdrop, the device can be flown to isolated areas and released by parachute. Shedding its tail section on landing, the grasshopper automatically puts out its legs and begins to push itself upright. Immediately, the device goes to work recording information on temperature, humidity, barometric pressure, and wind speed. Within seconds, it raises its broadcast antenna and starts transmitting a signal that can be picked up as far as 800 miles away. Back in the base laboratory, a technician records the weather data for study and evaluation. Here, he uses a special tape recorder, which translates the Morse code signals into a visual record. Regularly, for two full months, the reports will continue to come in. From the Navy's new weather robot, the Grasshopper. Fort Story, Virginia, the Army demonstrates its new landing craft retriever. She weighs 101 tons the only one of her kind in the world. Operated by a crew of six men, the X-1 stands 23 feet high and rolls on wheels 10 feet in diameter. When everything is ready for today's demonstration, the operator moves aft to the control deck and the X-1 begins her lumbering march to the beach. Here you get a good idea of her massive size. At six miles per hour, it takes quite a while for her 75-foot length to roll past. She doesn't pause at the beach, but heads straight out to sea. The mission for today is to pick up a landing craft stranded on a sandbar 100 yards offshore and carry it back to the servicing area for repairs. As crewmen go aboard the landing craft, the X-1 rolls in overhead, coming to rest astride the stranded vessel. Then the crewmen secure all hoisting lines, and the landing craft, crew and all, is lifted clear of the sandbar. This 29-ton craft is really light work for the X-1, which can carry up to 80 tons. The beach is steep, but it's no problem for the X-1's four-wheel drive. Pushing through treacherous loose sand to the servicing area, the X-1 proves that she can do the job she was created for. It's another forward step in the research and development program of the Army Transportation Corps. Son, you think that was big? I'd say it's puny, real puny. Now this, this is big, the biggest. 
That's on account of how it was made in Texas. Longview, Texas, I said. Built for the Army Transportation Corps to haul and tow it in Arctic conditions. Got a mighty big name, too. Logistical cargo carrier. But up north, and son, this is real north, doggone if those Yankees haven't shortened it to snow train. The biggest. You take those tires. They're four feet wide and 10 feet high. That little old power car, 40 feet long, 14 feet wide and 13 feet high. Got 600 horsepower diesels and a 500 gallon tank. Why, those cargo cars each carry 15 tons. Tons, I said. Son, it's the biggest, no matter what them Yankees say. The Army allows is how one man can work the whole shebang. But shucks, that's nothing if he's from Texas, too. Fundamental American freedoms, written into the Constitution in the First Amendments, are called the Bill of Rights. The First Amendment is the most important. This amendment forbids the federal government from interfering with any citizen's right to practice the religion of his choice, say, write, or print anything he wishes, meet with his fellow citizens to discuss what he wants to, complain to his government if he feels unjustly treated. Our founding fathers, who wrote these amendments into the Constitution, had memories of government interfering with personal freedom, and were anxious to make certain that the government of this new country would not repeat the same restrictions. This is the compound. The Army Quartermaster School, Langres, Germany. I work here. I'm a dog. The first time I saw a training class at work, I knew this job was for me. I had to be a soldier. So I put on my best manners and asked them. Pretty please. It worked. Two weeks later, I reported in for testing. It was a motley group, but like they say, it takes all kinds. We came from all over, but we all had the same ambition, to become a soldier. Well, almost all of us anyway. There's always some yard bird dragging his feet. 10 a.m., the testing began. A war dog can't afford to be gun shy. If you're chicken, you're a dead duck. For the rest of us, it was only the beginning. First, we had to demonstrate our technique for handling an armed suspect. This is called the aggravation test. I was aggravated. Ten fifteen a.m. Test completed. So far, so good. I was pretty sure I had passed because right away they had me bundled up for the medical check. The doc did a lot of poking around, but I understood. He just wanted to get the facts. Army standards are high. No 4Fs, no fleas. So I felt good when they took off the muzzle and said I was ready for duty. 10.45 a.m. This was the final step. As soon as the inspecting officer checked me off his list,
You might think that when a Navy frogman was off duty, he would go as far from water as possible just for a change of scenery. These boys from the underwater demolition team number two on assignment off the Virgin Islands have other ideas. They use their spare time to do some serious undersea fishing in Neptune's fascinating front yard. Armed with arbalests, which take their name from the ancient crossbow, the frogmen are ready to go hunting in the unexplored fields of the deep. Equipped with aqua lungs that carry about 1,800 pounds pressure and deliver oil-free compressed air, the hunters can stay down for about an hour at a time. Most of the good fishing is found in the shoreline waters up to 30 feet deep. If the diver is trained for the sport, he'll know that all he has to do is keep the body pressure equal to the water pressure and nothing will go wrong. For anyone who hasn't been in these waters, and we mean in them, it's an experience in a new and fascinating world. Brilliantly colored tropical fish lurk in the strange submarine vegetation or hide in the caves of rock and coral. For the pescatorial huntsman, it's a game preserved untouched since the beginning of time where new sporting thrills are awaiting on every foray. A game fish in the picture. Just like hunting topside, you keep your quarry in your sight as you carefully aim and fire. Whoops, just missed them. The arbalists, which are about three feet long, shoot a small harpoon or spearhead. They're fairly accurate in ranges from six to 10 feet. They're on the trail, or should we say tail, of another fish. That's no easy target, much faster on the getaway than most land animals. This time our huntsman takes good aim and lets him have it. Yes, sir, and that was slick shooting. On the target again. Most of these fellows are from two to five or six pounders. You've got to be quick on the trigger to hit them before they flash away. Sometimes you're stalking them out of rocks and caves, but you never have a dull moment in the pursuit. You might run into anything when you prod into the small, dark hideaways 30 feet down. The hunting is good. They are having better than fishermen's luck, as you can see. the big one that didn't get away. The quarry this time is a much tougher proposition. No amateur undersea fisherman would come off with it quite so handily, but that frogman knows his business. He has a fighting mad shark by the tail. Shark, even a comparatively small one, can kick up plenty of trouble. They are one of the toughest skinned and least vulnerable of any battler of the sea, and one of the most ferocious. There's only one way to finish him off, and you have to know how to accomplish that before he takes a chunk out of you. For a couple of frogmen with an afternoon off, it's been a pleasant day. Yes, sir, these boys from UDT number two, training off the Virgin Islands, have been hunting where the hunting's good. Why don't you come down sometime?